When a young person is reported missing and likely murdered, the police are usually the ones that have to keep composed and calm in the face of the victim's loved one's emotional devastation, except when it's those very same loved ones who turn out to be the reason that the person is even dead in the first place. In today's case, a home that should have been a place of security and comfort instead was a place of beatings, enforced isolation, and finally of death. Hey Coffee and Crimers, I'm your host, Belle Fagan, and today we're going to take a deeper look into an unspoken pandemic that tragically is still very real today and very prevalent, honour killings. Now, if you've not come across this term before, an honour killing is when a member of a family or social group is killed by other members due to the belief that the victim has brought dishonour upon their family or the community. Now, the death of the victim is viewed as a way to restore the reputation and the honour of the family, and it's usually for immoral or perceived immoral behaviour. So this could be infidelity, refusing to an arranged marriage, wanting slash getting a divorce, or perceived flirtatious behaviour, or even tragically, if they've been raped. Now, that one sickens me, because to kill a rape victim, it just doesn't even compute in my head. Now, the honour part is focused more on the perception of the community versus actual evidence. So you can imagine how over the years, honour killings have taken place as really just as an excuse for anything rather than the original cultural practice that it started as. On July the 14th, 1986, the world welcomed a new life. Shafilia Ahmed was born in Bradford, West Yorkshire, England, the daughter of Pakistani cousins, Fazana and Iftaha. Now, interestingly, when she was born, her father was actually still married to a Danish woman who he'd already had a son with. But growing pressure from his family, along with his own devout Islamic faith, meant that he did eventually marry his cousin, as had been arranged and enforced by their families. And they moved to Warrington in Cheshire, not long after Shafilia was born. The irony of his arranged marriage won't be lost on you as we go through this case, I'm sure, nor the fact that despite choosing to live in the UK, they didn't approve of Western lifestyles. Like most teenage girls growing up in the UK, or any Western culture really, she was determined and ambitious with a typical for her age, rebellious streak. She got great grades in school and dreamt of becoming a lawyer. But she wanted to wear the latest fashions like her friends, have a boyfriend and break free from her family home and live independently. But the difference between Shafilia and most of her friends was that she was born into and brought up around one culture, but was expected to abide by the rules of another. One steeped in tradition and different values. Before the age of 11, her life had been quiet and non-eventful. But as she got older and more aware of differences between her and the peers that she was growing up with, she wanted different. She ran away twice, but both times her parents found her staying with friends. And what would typically be seen as normal teenage behaviour was seen as shameful by her strict parents. Her mother even calling her a slut after she dyed her hair or put on false nails. And actually, this was the tamest of the disciplines, just calling her names. When either her or her sisters stepped out of line, they usually got severe beatings. Shafilia's brother was the only one of the siblings who never had a finger laid on him. Shafilia continued resisting her parents' demands despite going to school covered in cuts and bruises. If teachers or other adults made comments or voiced their concerns, Fazana and Iftiha cried racial prejudice and Islamophobia. The tightrope that Shafilia walked must have been so incredibly difficult because at the end of the day, abused children still have that instinctive love for their parents. So when the police spoke to her at school, she lied and told them everything was fine. She was terrified of what her parents would do if she spoke about her beatings. In March 2003, they decided that she needed an arranged marriage and that it would be the best thing for her. It would stop her wanting all this westernised stuff that she seemed to crave. So Shafilia was forced to travel with them to Pakistan to meet the man that they had paired her with. It was actually her cousin who was 10 years older than her. She refused, but they accepted on her behalf and hid her passport. 
Terrified at the thought of having to stay in Pakistan, Shafilia tried to kill herself by drinking bleach. Even though she survived, the bleach did huge damage to her throat and made it super difficult for her to swallow. It did mean, though, that they brought Shafilia back to Britain so that she could be treated at her local hospital. Now, doctors did question what had happened, and her parents told them that Shafilia had thought she was using mouthwash during a power cut in the home that they were staying in. This suicide attempt made things at home even more unbearable. The mutual hatred between the three of them was just palpable. Several months later, on September 11th, 2003, Shafilia went missing, in inverted commas. Her teacher noticed her absence and her friends noticed her absence. And her teacher even overheard her sisters discussing Shafilia's disappearance, shall we call it. But she waited a week to report her missing to police because when she spoke to her parents, they stressed that there wasn't an issue. They said that they hadn't reported her missing because when they tried to, police had told them that there was nothing they could do. She was over the age of 16. Obviously, this was all a lie. They hadn't contacted the police. And they just kept insisting to the teacher that she had run off with a boy. An official search was launched on the 18th of September, once police realised that she had kept missing her doctor's appointments for her throat. Her friends would all say that she just wouldn't because it was a source of discomfort to her, so she always kept her doctor's appointments. A nationwide manhunt was launched across England, so her parents, after being so unbothered initially, now turned on the crocodile tears for the TV cameras, claiming that they were distraught that she had gone missing. Her face was plastered on every news station and newspaper in the country. The crocodile tears that they'd worked so hard to perfect still didn't save them. With body language experts working for the police watching, during a television interview, they were asked if they had killed their teenage daughter. Iftikhar replied with an emphatic never, as his wife sat there silent, supposedly overcome by the grief of losing her eldest child. But he couldn't fool the experts. As he protested their innocence on camera, there was an involuntary movement that he couldn't hide as he wasn't even aware of it. It was an almost unnoticeable nod up and down, the kind of nod we would do if we were saying yes to something. And it was as he said the word never. His body language betrayed the truth that he and Fasana had worked so hard to hide. Detectives also learned that an arranged marriage was in the works and felt that Shafilia may have been murdered in an honour killing after refusing the marriage. But again, her parents insisted that she'd been free to make her own decisions and that they were only being stereotyped because they were Muslim and from Pakistan. Police then placed a hidden listening device in the Ahmed's home and overheard Iftihar talking about the British legal system. He told Farzana that it was impossible to convict someone without proof, but he was a little worried about the police finding DNA evidence in the car. Now, along with the body language experts analysis and the recordings, it was obvious that they were hiding something, but there just wasn't enough evidence for the police to convict them. Nearly five months later, in February 2004, a dismembered body was found in a river in Cumbria, England, after heavy flooding washed it up. Now, that is 70 miles away from the family's home. Although the body was unidentifiable because of severe decomposition, rumours started to fly that it was Shafilia because of a gold bracelet and a topaz ring that she owned. Two autopsies did come back inconclusive on the cause of death, but DNA and dental records came back as a match to Shafilia. There were no fingerprints or other DNA on her body, so again, police couldn't make a case against her parents, even though initially they were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping. Finally, in 2010, seven years after Shafilia was murdered, the case blew wide open. Police were called to the Ahmed's property on the 25th of August after Shafilia's younger sister, Alicia, arranged for a robbery to take place at her parents' home while she, her brother, her sisters and her mum were all in the house. Ironically, it was actually her parents who called the police to have her arrested when they realised it was her who'd organised for three masked men to break in, tie them up and steal cash and jewellery. Her mum was heard by a neighbour saying, This is down to you, you rotten bitch. You were texting all night and you opened the door to them. Now 22 years old, she was 15 the night of the murder. 
she was tired of the deceit. She was arrested and told the police everything. That after trying to force Ophelia to accept the arranged marriage, her parents were afraid that her refusal would bring shame on the family. So again, remember what I was saying that often honour killings aren't actually based on something they've done, but it's the perceived issue. So they were afraid, like I said, that this refusal would bring shame on the family. They didn't know that it was going to bring shame. They just felt it would. The night she disappeared, her mother had actually picked Shafelia up from her part-time job in a call centre and a huge fight had erupted when she saw that her daughter was wearing a t-shirt, a zip-up hoodie and a pair of skinny jeans. She started berating Shafelia immediately and their row carried on when they got home and Iftihar got involved. Now, instead of beating Shafelia, as they normally did, he and Farzana decided to end their daughter's rebellious ways once and for all. While Shafelia was sitting on the sofa, they held her down, stopping her from making an escape. During the struggle, they put a plastic bag over Shafelia's face and down her throat. Her legs kicking violently, her eyes wide with terror, but her mother and father didn't stop. Not only that, Shafelia's younger siblings all witnessed the entire scene. And when the deed was done, they saw their father putting Shafelia's body in a suitcase and into his car before driving off into the night. Her coming forward opened the floodgates and others followed, one of which was a young woman named Shahin Munir, who also gave evidence. She was close friends with Mivish Ahmed, another one of Shafilia's sisters. Shahin knew the Ahmeds because she attended the same mosque in Warrington. Four years previously, Mivish had told Shahin the truth about her sister's death. Rarely allowed out alone, the two friends had arranged to cross paths while in town. Shahin kept her head down so that Fazana wouldn't recognise her as they passed each other. I'd do anything to change that night. I wish I'd never seen, but I did, and Alicia did, but just sat there and watched. I even seen the suitcase they took her in. They knocked me over and smacked me because I seen it. Shahin told police that she couldn't tell anyone either because the Ahmeds had threatened Mevish that she would be next if she told anyone. So she felt that she was a victim too. Having Shahin know though provided an outlet for Mevish as she was able to talk about Shafilia, memories of them together as well as everything they went through. She told Shahin that Shafilia was treated the worst out of all the sisters. She was the most trouble in her parents' eyes. Sometimes they wouldn't allow Shafilia to eat, and other times they'd leave her outside in the rain. Once Alicia had come forward, Shahin felt that she could break her promise. Her description of the murder matched up with Alicia's evidence. And on September the 7th, 2011, police announced that Shafilia's parents had been charged with murder. Their trial began in May 2012 and lasted nearly 11 weeks. Sadly, Mavish denied everything and said that the letter that she had given Shahin was just freestyle writing and completely made up and she wouldn't back either Alicia's testimony or Shahin's. But the two of them stuck to their guns, determined to fight for Shafilia's memory and thankfully their evidence was enough for justice to be served. Shafilia's own words also helped convict her parents. The prosecution produced documents from February 2003, just before she was taken to Pakistan, to be forced into the marriage that she didn't want. Shafilia had run away and asked social services to help her find a place to live. In the application form, she said that she suffered from regular domestic violence, writing, One parent would hold me down whilst the other hit me. And that she was often prevented from attending college or her part-time job. They also read out song lyrics written by Shafilia that they had found in her bedroom. One poignant piece that she wrote was called Happy Families. I'll read a few lines, but you can find the full poem in the Cup of Coffee and Crime podcast discussion group. I don't pretend like we're the perfect family no more, the song begins. Desire to live is burning, my stomach is turning, but all they think about is honour. Now I'm sitting here playing happy family, still crying tears, but no, we're a happy family. I have these fears. I wish, I wish, I wish for a happy family. I lay in bed hoping the next day would be better, but it was just a thought because it never happened. Halfway through the trial, Fazana changed her story in an attempt to save her own skin. She blamed her husband for the murder and said that she had tried to stop Shafilia from being killed. But 
By August, they were both found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. Every year on July 14th, which is Shafilia's birthday, a day of memory is held for victims of honour-based abuse. She would have turned 37 this year. Shockingly, it is estimated that 12 honour-based killings happen each year in the United Kingdom, and that to me is just staggering. If you believe someone you know is a victim of honour-based abuse, these are some of the warning signs to look out for. They include acting withdrawn or upset, bruising or other unexplained physical injuries, depression, self-harm or attempted suicide, or unexplained absence or poor performance at work or school. Other signs could be strictly controlled movements, family rows, running away from home, or a family history of relatives going missing. Just going back to Alicia, she was arrested, as we said, and she did get convicted but given a suspended sentence. The judge who reviewed her case just felt that there were mitigating circumstances. All of the siblings had gone through so much, had seen so much, and although what she did was very wrong, those three men did have weapons, the judge did go easy on her. And I don't disagree. I think all of those kids in their own way have just been thoroughly messed up. The other siblings have all stuck by their parents, again, shockingly, but trauma does funny things to people. So thankfully for Alicia, although she did get a record and a 12-month suspended sentence, she didn't actually serve any jail time. I do also want to make the point that, yes, we're talking about honour killings in a family that were devout to their Islamic faith. However, this doesn't mean that absolutely every Muslim in this country abides by the cultural practice of honour killings. So I don't want this podcast to come across as a way that we are tarring every single Muslim in this country with that brush. This is just an incident, a case that happened and, in my opinion, needed to be discussed. Thanks for listening. If you're enjoying being here, please leave a review on whatever platform you get your podcasts and click on the link in today's case description to join the Cup of Coffee and Crime Facebook discussion group for more information and relevant photos of today's case. Until next week, stay safe.